1645 and Tsar Michael of Russia is a bit dead. He was the first ruler of the Romanov dynasty and oversaw a pretty tumultuous time in Russia. He was succeeded by the young Alexis who left most of the actual governing to a man called Boris Moritsov who was a boyar. What's a boyar? Well, they were high-ranking nobles who had previously wielded immense power, but were much reduced since the Romanovs came to power. Moritsov was a competent, if not corrupt, bureaucrat, and he tried to raise more money for the government. Moritsov would be thrown out of office by the Tsar in 1648 after he raised taxes on salt, which caused a riot. So Russia at this point had one glaring issue. It was economically backwards. It was mostly backwards in things like agriculture, which had made immense technical progress in other parts of Europe like the Netherlands and England. In Russia, however, agriculture made no progress and farming methods remained the same since there were loads of peasants and slaves to do the work. In 1649, though, Alexis issued a law code which freed all of the agricultural slaves in Russia and then made them serfs. He also sought to give better defined legal status to the agricultural peasants by making them serfs. Serfdom, being a serf, was a hereditary status which expressly tied you to the land of your lord. Previously, many peasants and slaves had fled their lords because agricultural work sucked. See, in Russia, a shortage of reasonable land wasn't an issue, because Russia is huge. It was labour that was valuable, and so preventing the movement of serfs protected the wealth of the nobility and, of course, the Tsar. In terms of foreign policy, Alexis was quite peaceful. Just kidding, in 1654 he invaded the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was suffering from its own instability. The Russians performed extremely well at first and occupied most of the country, which was then invaded by the Swedish too, because why not? Poland-Lithuania defeated the Swedish and started to turn the tide, but a civil war broke out and financial ruin forced them to sue for peace. Russia gained this territory, including the cities of Smolensk and Kiev, the latter of which was supposed to be only temporary, but fun fact, no. Alexis's reign also saw religious reform. Alexis believed that Russia was being punished because it was straying from the correct religious path. He thus sought to reform church practices with the help of the Patriarch of Moscow, Patriarch Nikon, the head of the Orthodox Church in Russia. This was, unsurprisingly, met with resistance from those who considered the changes to be too dramatic and too Western. And by Western, I mean that they were in line with the Ukrainian and Greek Orthodox churches, not like France or something. In 1668, a synod was called to formalise these changes. Those who resisted these new practices were excommunicated and became known as Old Believers. These these old believers would represent a sizeable schism in the Russian Orthodox Church for many more centuries. Alexis also had issues with revolt. One such revolt was led by a man called Stenka Razin, a Cossack who in 1670 had captured the city of Tsaritsyn and was pillaging literally everything. A series of peasant revolts coincided with this and it took a year for the central Moscow government to quell the uprisings and eventually execute Razin. In 1676, Alexis shook off his mortal coil and was succeeded by his eldest son, Theodor, who was crowned Theodor III. So the young Theodor was a good sponsor of the church and sought to strengthen its position whilst encouraging learning across the Sardom. This was pretty much all he did since he died at the ripe old age of 21 in 1682. This left two potential heirs to the throne, Alexis' eldest surviving son Ivan from his first wife who was very sickly and Peter the healthy son of his second wife. Well, the supporters of Peter had him quickly proclaimed Tsar, which caused Ivan's supporters to riot. Ivan's supporters were aided by the Strozzi, the palace guard, who stormed the royal palace and basically murdered everyone who had ever wronged them. In the end, it was determined that both Ivan and Peter would be co-rulers and that Ivan's sister, Sophia, would act as regent for them both. During his youth, Peter wasn't kept in Moscow, but sent to a place called Priobrazhenskoye, where he developed a love for the military and, in particular, a fascination with ships and navies. Sophia, who was aided by a man called Vasily Galitsyn, ruled throughout the 1680s with fair competence. She signed the Treaty of Eternal Peace with Poland in 1686, which did two things. One, it signed Russia up to an anti-Ottoman alliance, and two, demonstrated that nobody knew what the term eternal meant. In 1689, Sophia came up with the great idea, let's crown me and depose the two Tsars. To the nobility and the Strozzi that had supported her, this was a step too far, and she was sent away to a convent for the rest of her life. This left both Ivan and Peter as joint rulers, but since Ivan was unable to rule, this made Peter the primary Tsar. Although it was his mother who was really in charge until 1694 when she came down with a case of the deads. Two years later, Ivan also died, meaning that all of Russia was finally Peter's. The first thing that Peter, or Peter I, did with his newfound freedom was what all great Russian leaders would do thereafter. Invade the Ottoman Empire. Russia was already at war with the Ottomans as part of an alliance, but Peter made sure that there was a renewed effort at taking southern territory. This saw Russia gain this territory, Azov, which importantly gave it access to the sea in the south. So Peter was a very involved leader who took great pride in personally overseeing government reforms and projects. For example, in 1697 he launched what is called the Grand Embassy. This was where his diplomats travelled around Europe, securing new military technology and know-how, as well as strengthening the alliance against the Ottoman Empire. He travelled with this embassy personally, although for the most of it he was in disguise. He travelled to many countries across Europe, gaining valuable information, but had no luck with fighting the Ottomans. His Grand 
Ukraine's embassy had to be cut short when the Streltsy started to revolt in Moscow. This was put down before Peter even returned to Russia, but afterwards all of those involved were severely punished. Peter had a strong distaste for the Muscovite way of life, i.e. he disliked many of the old ways of doing things. He took on a more European way of dress and abandoned the full beards that previous Russian leaders and the boyars had sported. You could opt not to, but then you'd have to pay a beard tax. Peter oversaw a simplification of the Russian alphabet, banned arranged marriages, and also changed the Russian calendar to the Julian one. So whilst travelling across Europe, Peter had learned a great deal about navies, how they operate and how to build them. The problem for Peter was that he needed access to a better coast, the Baltic one specifically. One issue, it was controlled by the Swedish Empire. Peter thus made an alliance with Denmark and Saxony, whose leader was also the ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth against Sweden. Together they invaded and so began the Great Northern War. Denmark near immediately withdrew from the war, allowing Sweden to turn East. Undeterred, Peter clashed with the Swedish at the 1700 Battle of Narva, where he was completely crushed by the better trained and equipped Swedish forces. Sweden hereafter turned its attention to Saxony and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which gave Peter the chance to regroup. He subsequently pushed into the lands of Ingria and Livonia and took this territory. To keep these territorial gains, Peter constructed a fort here and founded a settlement in 1703. St. Petersburg. Over the next four years, Sweden managed to stomp Saxony in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and in 1707 its army advanced into Russia. Like so many others in history, the invasion was difficult because winter rolled around, and winter in Russia is very, very cold. Swedish forces retreated down south, and Peter followed, where they clashed at the Battle of Poltava. Here, the Swedish army was decisively beaten, Charles XII fled to the Ottoman Empire, and his army surrendered shortly afterwards. Peter demanded that the Ottomans hand Charles over, which they said no to, and so, more war. Fortunately for Russia, Denmark and Poland-Lithuania had re-entered the war. Unfortunately for Russia, the Ottoman army was incredibly formidable, and Peter's recent gains down south were lost in 1711. The year after this defeat, Peter made a monumental decision. He moved the capital of the Sardin from Moscow to St. Petersburg, because again, he didn't care for the old ways. Even though he was at war, Peter still wished to reform his kingdom, but there were many opponents to this reform, not least was his son and heir to the throne, Alexis. Alexis had been raised by some boyars, many of whom resented Peter's reforms, and he grew up to despise his father. When, in 1716, Peter wanted Alexis to join him on campaign, Alexis fled to Austria, which made Peter look pretty bad. In 1718, Alexis returned after his father had agreed that he wouldn't be punished. And shortly after this, Peter had Alexis tortured to death for embarrassing him. Peter then changed the rules of succession from my nearest relative gets it to I get to pick who's next. Beyond filicide, Peter had introduced widespread modernising reforms in areas like justice, religion, and of course, the military. In terms of justice, Peter banned lawyers from courtrooms because, and I'm not kidding here, they talk too much. Judges also weren't permitted to make new rulings because in Peter's Russia, only legislators could interpret law. And there was only one legislator. Peter. As for the military, Peter is often seen as the founder of the Russian navy. By 1720, Russia's Baltic fleet was larger than the entire Swedish navy. This was quite impressive considering that in 1710, Russia didn't have a single naval vessel. In terms of religious reform, Peter decided in 1721 to abolish the position of Patriarch of Moscow and replace it with the Holy Synod. This was basically a council of men whom he could bully into doing what he wanted. 1721 was a pretty big year for both Peter and Russia. First of all, the Great Northern War ended in a Russian victory and saw Russia gain all of this territory. Having control over this, Russia's position in Europe and that of Peter was much more prestigious. As such, Peter decided that his title of Tsar wasn't fancy enough and he declared his new title to be Imperator or Emperor and the Tsardom of Russia was now the Russian Empire. In 1722, Peter created his Table of Ranks whereby people's rank in society was ideally no longer to be determined by birth but now how useful they were. This saw many sons of boyars lose favour and some new men, i.e. nobly born people who worked for the government, rise up the ranks. Peter, in 1723, also freed all of the household slaves in Russia and made them serfs. Peter's transformative reign would come to an end in 1725 when he died and so it was time for his appointed heir to take over. Oh wait, he didn't pick one and so, decades of succession disputes and turmoil, which culminated in Catherine the Great. But that's for another time. So Peter the Great's legacy is undeniably important, but also deeply complex and controversial. His reign, which only happened because the stars aligned, took Russia from being a kingdom on the other side of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to an empire that nobody could ignore. He laid the foundations for Russia's rise to great power status and deprived that same status from Sweden. He was responsible for many sensible reforms and modernised the Russian system of government. Society, religion and warfare changed under his stewardship, and so it's no wonder that he's seen as the epitome of the enlightened despot. One who could bring Russia a great deal of glory, and ultimately, someone who was willing to kill his own son to protect that glory. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching, and a special thanks to Thomas Gestrich, Adam Harvey, Winston Kaywood, and James Bizanet. If you'd like to learn more about Peter the Great and the Russian Empire, there are some book recommendations in the description below.